Drugs affecting the respiratory system. So the respiratory tract overall is a pretty decent germ fighter. The upper respiratory tract is responsible for sneezing, excessive mucus production, all in the effort to try to get foreign invaders out of the respiratory tract. Past the nose, in the laryngeal area, the trachea, or the bronchioles, when those areas specifically are stimulated, then it elicits a cough reflex, which again tries to expel foreign invaders. The larynx will slam shut, and that's a laryngeal spasm, to prevent anything from going past the larynx and into the lower respiratory tract. The trachea and the bronchioles have sheets of mucus covered epithelium so the epithelial cells themselves are secreting heaps of mucus and in general they're they're ciliated epithelial cells as well so they're trying to get foreign invaders out and that could be foreign bacteria physical pieces of food or otherwise or of course viruses too there's also multi-unit smooth muscles all around the alveoli to shut them off and tons of macrophages live within the respiratory tract to help aid in the prevention of foreign invaders. Overall, the prevention of pathogen infiltration through expulsion, dilution with mucus, and then bronchoconstriction to avoid further travel. So these, of course, are all protective mechanisms for the respiratory tract, but they have some long-term consequences as well. When these specific mechanisms are engaged for long periods of time, they can lead to long-term problems. Sometimes we, we need to shut down the protective mechanisms in order to actually allow the body to heal properly. Non-productive coughs, so coughs without a huge amount of mucus production, can collapse areas of the trachea or can damage the vasculature to the heart. And when we damage the vasculature to the heart, we get core pulmonale, or right-sided heart failure, which ends up being an enlargement of the right ventricle due to high blood pressure in the lungs, typically caused by chronic lung disease. Likewise, asthma in chronic cases, of course, can lead to long-term inflammation in the bronchioles, which can, of course, lead to a degree of permanent inflammation or scarring. So we want to look at, of course, the risks and the benefits associated with controlling the cough and controlling some of these respiratory side effects or symptoms. So the cough reflex overall is coordinated by the cough center, which is a cluster of neurons located next to the respiratory centers in the medullary area of the brain stem. So it's one of the basic areas of the brain. The presence or irrit of irritation or stimulation of cough receptors in the larynx, trachea, bronchi, or bronchioles send impulses to the brainstem, where the cough reflexes is constriction of the appropriate respiratory muscles to produce that sharp, forceful expiration, which of course is a cough. So we know that dogs typically will cough if they've got irritation in their larynx or their trachea. Cats coughing is a little bit more serious in general. We know that cats are obligate nose breathers and cats who cough, we never want to take it too, too lightly. That's something that if they're continuously coughing, then of course we want to have them looked at by the vet. Same with dogs, but cats, it's a little bit more of a red flag because it's extremely abnormal for cats to open mouth breathe and for cats to cough. So then we have to look at what kind of cough is it specifically? So when the larynx or the pharynx is stimulated by irritation or pressure from food or other materials, receptors send impulses to the brain stem through the, through the vagus nerve, and that results in a gagging or violent retching type coughing. Stimulation of these receptors can also produce a reflex constriction of the small terminal bronchioles, so bronchoconstriction. Receptors lower in the trachea and those located in the bronchi respond to mechanical and chemical irritation or the release of histamine by producing that deep cough mediated by the cough center. Rapid breathing or tachypnea and reflex bronchoconstriction can also accompany this type of stimulation. This deeper type of cough is associated with bronchitis, inhalation of irritating gases, allergic bronchoconstriction, or pressure of the bronchi from an enlarged heart. So all sorts of different causes uh, for different types of coughs. So looking at blocking the cough, an antitussive is a drug that blocks the cough reflex. Coughs in general can be classified as productive coughs or non-productive coughs. A productive cough produces mucus, and a non-productive cough is that dry, hacking cough with no significant mucus production. 
So these drugs that are antitussives and generally prevent the cough reflex, we have to be very cautious in using an antitussive when the animal is unable to clear thick mucus from the respiratory tree. So if they have a productive cough, then an antitussive can actually become more dangerous to them because they need to clear that mucus that's deep down in the respiratory tract. If they can't clear it, then of course it's going to maintain itself within the respiratory tract and clog the bronchioles. Typically, we don't use antitussives in general for productive coughs because we want the virus to work its course and just work its way out of the body. So for productive coughs, typically you can see the use of humidifiers and nebulizers to assist with production of mucus and allowing that thick, dry mucus to sort of moisten up and eventually escape the body during coughing. There are two types of antitussives. We have central acting and they suppress the cough center right in the brain. So an example of that would be the opioid hycodin, which is a liquid version of hydrocodone. And we give this orally, of course, to suppress coughs. Now, that being said, of course, it's an opioid, so there are always, always risks and benefits associated with this. Of course, long-term use can cause constipation. There's potential that it could cause sedation. And then, of course, looking at the overall safety when it comes to humans, it is addictive and it is a recordable or a controlled substance. So we have to do our due diligence in sort of tracking that drug and speaking with clients about it appropriately. The other type of antitussive is a locally acting, which locally reduce irritation. For this, of course, it's going to work well in humans, but dogs and cats, we can't really ask them to hang on to a lozenge in their mouth particularly well. So dogs and cats, generally we're talking about a central acting uh, antitussive. So looking at the risks and benefits, the risks of long-term treatment always have to be weighed against the benefits. And remember, if we're suppressing the cough, then we're losing out on the body's natural ability to fend off invaders through the use of that cough mechanism. Long-term, the non-productive coughs typically that we're discussing are due to tracheal collapse or core pulmonale, asthma or COPD in horses. Short-term, it's typically acute lung disease, such as pneumonia, that we're looking at. Antitussives overall, we mentioned hydrocodone, but we can also use the opioid but, uh, butorphanol. It's a centrally acting opioid cough suppressant. It's classified as a controlled substance, so we have to be very cautious of how we dispense this and how we record it. It's commonly used as an analgesic or sedative. As we know, I've mentioned previously, it's not an ideal analgesic on its own. It's okay when mixed with other NSAIDs and analgesic type drugs, but on its own it's not quite ideal. Better as a sedative. And of course remember that all opioid drugs suppress the respiratory center and the cough center overall. Hydrocodone, mentioned previously, it's orally administered and it's a potent mu agonist more potent than codeine and it's synthesized from codeine, so it's essentially a derivative of codeine. We can mask the signs of pain, so that's one thing that we have to be cautious. If the animal is progressing into a painful disease process, we will mask the signs of pain. This, of course, is a controlled substance, and constipation and sedation are common. Codeine we can use as well. It's a relatively weak mu opioid receptor against or agonist for antitussive, its antitussive effects. It's used in many cough formulations, but more so with people. Side effects are very similar to hydrocodone. Caution with variations. So we've got anywhere from a C2 to a C3. A C2, which is um, codeine 2, essentially is pure codeine, but C3 or Tylenol 3 is acetaminophen plus codeine. So you have to be very cautious of that, especially if we're getting it compounded by a, ph a human pharmacy or dispensed by a human pharmacy. The best bet, of course, is to go through a veterinary pharmacy for compounding, just to ensure that the medications are specific to veterinary medicine and not to people. Dextromethorphan. It's not recommended to use um, in animals to control coughing in general for dogs and cats. It's the human over-the-counter medication. And in general, it's simply determined not to be overly effective for dogs and cats. Moving on, we have mucolytics. So mucolytics, of course, the goal is to get the bad stuff out. So it's to break down and lyse the mucus to allow lower viscosity. 
It allows ciliary removal. So we know that throughout the lower respiratory tract, we've got many ciliated epithelial cells, which of course will expel dirt, debris, etc., from the respiratory tract with their little finger-like projections. Overall, we're mostly talking about acetylcysteine, which is also called mucomist as its trade name. And the goal of mucomist is to decrease the viscosity of mucus. Most often it's administered by nebulization, for this specific purpose, and it breaks up the disulfide bonds in the actual DNA of cellular debris and inflammatory cells. Mucomist also we'll talk about when we discuss anti-inflammatories and toxicity. Mucomist is often used IV for acetaminophen toxicity in cats, but for this specific purpose, we typically give it through a nebulizer into the animal's respiratory tract to help break up the mucus. The goal again is if this is thick, chunks of mucus, they can't get it out of their bronchial, so they can't get it out of that bronchial space on their own. So if we're able to reduce the viscosity, make it a little bit more fluid-like, then the goal is to hopefully allow them to cough and get this mucus out of the respiratory tract. Expectorants increase the fluidity of mucus, similar to that of the mucolytics, but mucolytics are breaking it down on a, those DNA disulfide bonds. So expectorants increase the amount of water to the respiratory tract, so they're drawing water into the respiratory tract. Stimulate this via the parasympathetic nervous system. It is of questionable benefit in veterinary patients. Guaifenesin and saline expectorants are common, typically referred to as GG for the um, guaifenesin. Equine anesthetic protocols, sometimes we will use expectorants as a complementary medication for equine anesthetic protocols and one thing to keep in mind is that they can cause vomiting in dogs and cats. So the ones that we're talking about here typically are the Robitussin. Now in general we don't recommend that clients go to the grocery store or the pharmacy and pick up Robitussin for their coughing dog or cat. Number one of course we want to see them at the vet hospital to find out exactly what is causing the cough. If it's viral, if it's something structural like uh, an enlarged heart, etc. And then of course as well, because we know that these aren't overly effective for dogs and cats because they're of questionable benefit, we're just not sure if we're going to end up doing more harm than good. Now the other thing too with Robitussin and other over-the-counter over expectorants, they often have other drugs in them. So they might have um, pseudoephedrines as well to help with sort of sinus type inflammation. So you have to be very, very cautious when clients go ahead and go to the store and just help themselves to expectorants. It's a good idea to have a conversation with them about risks versus benefits. The saline expectorant, which is ammonium chloride, potassium iodide, and sodium citrate are typically via oral dosing, and they can easily cause gastrointestinal upset. So typically we're talking about vomiting with the saline expectorants in dogs and cats. Essential oils. So essential oils, of course, are on trend right now, very much so. When it comes to respiratory illness in dogs and cats, they're not overly useful. So although with us, we might appreciate a nice eucalyptus vaporizer in our room to help us breathe a lot better. Unfortunately for dogs and cats, it can actually be an irritant and we have to be cautious. They don't have that many studies about the effects of um, inhalant essential oils for dogs and cats. And we know that, of course, they recommend in people that you avoid a lot of these essential oils if you're pregnant or if you have a new baby. And it just makes me question the benefit for dogs and cats and po also possibly the level of toxicity for dogs and cats. So it's something to keep in mind. It's definitely not recommended if your dog or cat is having difficulty breathing or is challenged with a cough. They directly stimulate the respiratory cells. Some examples that clients might recommend are pine, eucalyptus, peppermint, etc. But of course, remembering that some definitely we know are toxic, at least in a topical form, such as tea tree oil. 
Decongestions. These reduce congestion of swollen nasal tissues by stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, to cause vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction, of course, in the right areas will cause less swelling. Pseudoephedrine is an effective decongestant. It's a precursor for methamphetamine production and is regulated either by prescription or having to purchase the product from the pharmacist, so from behind the counter. So it's not just readily available on the shelves, depending where you are in general, because sometimes pseudoephedrine is included in other medications such as sinus medications, and we can go ahead and just buy that um, from the from the shelf. But when it comes to heavy-duty decongestants, where they have pseudoephedrine as the key and heavy-duty ingredient, then of course you'd be talking to the pharmacist first. Phenylephrine is also a decongestant. It's not considered to be as effective a decongestant as the pseudoephedrine. It's not a precursor, though, to methamphetamines. Decongestants are typically not used in veterinary medicine. So although pseudoephedrine is a great decongestant. The trouble is that we have some side effects that are not ideal for dogs and cats. So we get this transient tachycardia, which can last as long as the drug has an effect on the body. So we get this tachycardia due to stimulation of the beta, so the the cardiac beta receptors from pseudoephedrine. So although pseudoephedrine going back is an excellent decongestant and in animals it's an excellent decongestant as well the side effect of having this transient tachycardia associated with the beta 1 receptors is a challenge and that makes it less ideal and typically less prescribed for dogs and cats in veterinary medicine bronchodilators we typically that's something that is fairly well prescribed, especially for cats. Bronchoconstriction is the contraction of the smooth muscles surrounding the small terminal bronchioles deep within the respiratory tree. So we're talking about the lower respiratory system. Drugs are poisons that mimic acetylcholine or stimulate the mus- muscarinic cholinergic receptor produce bronchoconstriction and dyspnea. So they constrict those little bronchioles, which are already small spaces. They're going to make them even smaller. And of course, that results in dyspnea or difficulty breathing. Most often, we're talking about feline asthma and equine RAO, which is recurrent airway obstruction. Now, I appreciate that, I think it was earlier in this presentation, that I mentioned um, COPD in horses. I think it was right at the beginning I said COPD, which of course is chronic obstruction, uh, obstructive pulmonary disease or disorder in horses. They have recently suggested a change to that name because COPD in humans is mostly associated with the effects of smoking cigarettes. So in horses, of course, it's not due to the effects of smoking cigarettes. So they've changed the name effectively to RAO, which is recurrent airway obstruction. So bronchoconstriction, uh, typically it's an allergy or histamine and inflammation induced. Organophosphate toxicity as well could cause this. And that's specifically because it blocks that acetylcholine esterase, which of course breaks down the acetylcholine in between the the neurons. And it starts stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system, which in turn causes bronchoconstriction. So organophosphate toxicity, of course, we know that it causes all sorts of problems for cats with that lack of acetylcholine esterase. And then of course, it can also create this really acute and severe bronchoconstriction. Blocking of the beta-2 receptors, their acetylcholine antagonistic properties are blocked and they allow the bronchoconstriction. And then, of course, blocking the beta-2 also blocks the body's ability to prevent degranulation of mast cells. So bronchodilators that we're talking about, we've got beta-adrenergic agonist bronchodilators, just a small name, no big deal. You could call it BABS if you want, B-A-A-B. Epinephrine and isoproteranol were non-selective beta agonists and thus stimulated beta-1 receptors and beta-2 receptors. So those are the ones that we used to use more so in the past. However, the newer bronchodilator drugs are terbutaline and albuterol, as well as metaproteranol. Now, albuterol, also known as salbutamol or ventolin, that is probably the number one most common, especially when prescribed to cats or horses. You can have it as tablets or as a metered dose inhaler. Beta-2 stimulations 
ends up creating relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle. The bronchioles dilate and of course the animal can breathe easier. Likewise, they also stabilize mast cells. So we know that mast cells carry histamine and when mast cells degranulate, then we get this huge histamine response, which of course inflammatory um, action results from that. So if we can stabilize the mast cells, then we're going to prevent that degranulation of the histamine. Likewise too, there is a degree of mucolytic properties within these inhalers. These are also more selective beta-2 agonists and have fewer but still some beta-1 side effects and they tend to last longer than the older bronchodilators. One thing to note, because we still have some beta-1 side effects, especially when it comes to albuterol, if anybody has ever used this for their own asthma, they've changed it recently I find, but you can still get this very quick tachycardia that happens. So as soon as an animal is given a meter dose inhaler, so an in inhalation of their inhaler, they can get this very, very short lasting tachycardia because of that beta-1 side effect, so that cardiac stimulation through beta-1 receptors. Terbutaline, albuterol, metaproteranol, and clenbuterol, the ones that we're speaking about, we're talking about dogs, cats, and horses that they're typically prescribed for, felines with asthma, and of course, um, the oral dosing syrup for horses with RAO. Terbutaline injection can be given for emergency use as well. And just to note that the downside with this general class of drugs is that you can get that small amount of short-lasting tachycardia because of that beta-1 stimulation. Then we have methylxanthine bronchodilators, and in this class we have theophylline, aminophylline, also caffeine and theobromine to a degree, although we never prescribe caffeine and theobromine. So the goal of these ones is to relax smooth muscle in the bronchioles by stimulating cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which promotes the relaxation of the smooth muscle, which creates bronchodilation. Aminophylline, 80% is of, of the makeup of aminophylline is theophylline and 20% ethylenediamine salt. Again, we're using these ones, even this class as well, for feline asthma, and then more so as well for canine congestive heart failure and bronchitis. So theophylline could cause nausea and diarrhea in dogs. That's the slow-release capsules or the slow-release tablets. It has a narrow therapeutic index for muscle spasms as well and tremors due to its CNS stimulation. There is the likelihood of a tachycardia, it's associated with these drugs and multiple drug interactions. So we have to watch because it does have CNS stimulation effects. We have to watch out with its use with anticonvulsants, clindamycin, simididine, etc. So any drug essentially that's affecting the CNS, we always have to watch out uh, combination with other CNS drugs. And it also has a narrow margin of safety in horses with RAO. So good, but also a little bit challenging. Other drugs of use, we have, especially in chronic conditions, we have the use of steroids, which we talk about in our anti-inflammatory discussion. Steroids are typically given to either equine or um, feline patients who are undergoing that chronic RAO or asthmatic type disease. Likewise, they can be given to dogs, too, who have chronic respiratory illness. Antimicrobials, of course, to get the, the disease process under control if it's a bacteria-based disease. Antihistamines to reduce that release of histamine from the mast cells and therefore reduce inflammation. Diuretics to a degree as well, of course, oxygen. So anytime we have a patient coming in who's in respiratory distress, the first step, of course, while we're getting their stats is to put them on a flow by oxygen to ensure that even though they're dyspneic and not breathing particularly well, we're increasing their chances of acquiring oxygen by giving them 100% oxygen by flow by. And that is all for today.